So what I'd like to do is cover something that I don't really see enough of in my view and I uh, look forward to any feedback that you may have regarding it. But basically it concerns maybe what is the most important question that we all face, which is ultimately uh, why do we do what we're all doing? Or to put it another way, what's the business value of all of this stuff, whether it's software as a service or lower layer infrastructure services or what have you. So um, I coined this term cloudonomics a little while ago and I've been sticking with it. Um, for those of you that don't know, I'm from a company called Telex, and Telex is a national provider of data center co-location and carrier neutral interconnection uh, facilities. And um, I'm not really going to be giving any sort of sales pitch for Telex, although I do love Telex, and actually it uh, has a critical role to play in some of the uh, quantitative analysis I've done regarding how architectures are likely to unfold in the, co in the coming years. So I'm going to uh, start off with some basics and then <clears throat> go into a little bit more depth. Um, and one thing we can do is start with the NIST definition of cloud, which actually is a great definition. Uh, under federal law, no conference can uh, proceed without at least one reference to the NIST definition. So I wanted to be fully compliant. Um, the only problem with the definition, as you can see, is it's so wordy that it won't even fit on the slide. So uh, in my book, uh, I delve into a lot of different topics, some strategic, more, uh, and some that are more statistics and uh, calculus-based, um, with even a little trig thrown in. Very exciting. Uh, I just eliminated any possibility of interest in reading it, I know. Um, but what I do is I talk about the cloud as um, a very simple acronym, C-L-O-U-D, Common Location Independent Online Utility uh, On-Demand Resources. And um, this actually uh, is semantically equivalent to the NIST definition, uh, common resources in the sense of pooled and or uh, multi-tenant resources that are dynamically allocated to a variety of customers, <clears throat> location independent in the sense that it doesn't really matter where you are or where the cloud is when you use it. Uh, online in the sense of the uh, importance of the network, or as NIST would say, broad network access. A utility, in other words, a pay-per-use model, um, which in other industries is sometimes called uh, linear tariff, uh, and then on-demand resources. Um, and this is not only a clever acronym if you are an English speaker, but I've actually worked out a lot of the math behind the performance of a lot of these attributes. So um, I won't get into a lot of depth here. I'll just maybe build out the equations a little bit. It turns out that <clears throat> with some fairly abstract analysis, what you can do is determine um, lots of interesting things. For example, where the break-even point is for hybrid architectures based on uh, cost differentials and unit cost for resources like computing and storage. It turns out that you can figure out exactly what sort of investment is required on either a plane or a sphere um, if you're interested in reducing latency based on additional service node build out so you can answer questions like is 11,000 servers or more in a content delivery architecture the right approach or not. You can look at trade-offs in parallelism um, for partly serial, uh, partly embarrassingly parallel applications and you can do all kinds of fun things. And you can even take it further, uh, which I'm not going to talk about today, and have a pretty rigorous mathematical foundation for this notion of an abstract distributed computing architecture. So the good news for you, since it's breakfast, is um, I put this up here so you could thank me for the fact that I am not going to cover this any further in this presentation. A round of applause, please. Thank you. You're welcome. You owe me, each owe me a cup of coffee. So what I'm going to do instead is talk about strategy and economics of the cloud. And what I want to do is talk about some of the basics. Um, first, we all know that the cloud is a revolutionary new technology and business model that's transforming our industry. It's services or resources delivered over the internet. Um, the original focus in cloud used to be primarily cost reduction. But uh, about a year and a half ago, people started realizing that 
actually it was just about uh, business agility as well. And rather than just focusing on the cost side, a critically important benefit was, in fact, um, the fact that businesses could be more agile, which is critically important in today's highly competitive global marketplace. Um, a very famous uh, consulting slash research company that shall remain nameless uh, wrote a great uh, paper called Economies of Scale or the Key to Cloud Benefits. And the point there is that a lot of the cost reduction comes about through these economies of scale. Um, and so hyperscale providers therefore deliver dramatic benefits over um, sort of mom and pop shop providers. Um, another huge benefit that again, according to federal law, you can't give a cloud presentation without mentioning is the CapEx to OpEx translation because CapEx is absolutely evil and uh, OpEx is magnificent. Uh, rational decision makers will select the lowest cost option, of course, and therefore, because the cloud gives you these lower costs based on economies of scale, uh, customers as rational decision makers will select the lowest cost and it becomes sort of a self-perpetuating virtuous cycle as more and more customers are attracted to the lower cost provider that drives economies of scale. Um, that in turn means that there will only be a handful of providers. Um, someone quipped that Thomas J. Watson, Jr. or Sr., whoever it was, was right. Uh, when he said there would only be five computers in the world, and the five computers are uh, Amazon Web Services, Facebook, uh, Google, Microsoft, etc. cetera. Uh, Nick Carr wrote uh, extremely eloquently uh, and with great reference to uh, terrific historical analogy about the big switch to the cloud, um, with the observation being that um, no one generates their own electricity in their backyard anymore, and there was a big historic evolution from the last water wheel, Burden's water wheel, which was sort of the on-premises um, utility uh, adjacent to the factory to the global electric grid that we use now. Um, and of course, just like electricity, that leads inevitably to commoditization, um, where you, know, you can't really differentiate one electron uh, from another, and therefore, you probably can't really differentiate one processing cycle or whatever from another, especially because they're all you know, Intel or maybe AMD slash ARM going forward um, architectures. <clears throat> Nick also wrote uh, with a very compelling argument about the notion that IT doesn't really matter. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit more, but the point is that since IT is non-strategic, cost optimization is key. Um, there have been a number of other people more recently that have echoed that argument. Um, and because of all this cost reduction, um, cloud reduces computing costs, uh, which in turn means that uh, IT spend will go down, right? If you're spending, you know, when the cost of uh, gasoline goes down, obviously you spend a lot less on fuel costs. Um, and there are a few issues, one of which is electricity consumption being too high, and the other one is security. So these, for those of you that aren't fully immersed in the cloud, are all of the basics uh, about cloud. I think you can pretty much read them anywhere, but I wanted to summarize them. And the main reason I wanted to summarize them is that they're all wrong. Um, and if they're not all wrong, then at least they're very debatable. Um, and I'm going to go into some of these, but just to hit a few highlights, uh, I don't think the cloud is either a revolutionary new technology or business model. Um, the notion of pay-per-use on-demand resources, I've tracked back at least 2,500 years to the Roman Republic. Um, cloud re services are uh, sometimes delivered over the internet, particularly for this audience, but equally important are network technologies like Fiber Channel and MPLS, and we're seeing a lot more uh, VPN-like um, direct connect types of services to connect up to the cloud. And while user connectivity to cloud or hybrid architectures um, certainly can be uh, primarily over the internet. Um, if you look at a lot of the back-end hybrid architectures that tie enterprise data centers to the cloud or some cloud providers to other cloud providers at the intercloud um, for things like um, capacity reinsurance, uh, it turns out that much more robust network technologies are relevant. Uh, there are so many benefits of the cloud that to pin them down merely to cost reduction 
um, is sort of missing the broader point, and I'm going to talk about that broader point in a second. And business agility sounds really good um, as a, uh, a wannabe uh, quant jock. I have no idea what that even means. Um, I can quantify everything else. I can quantify cost. I can quantify statistical multiplexing effects in terms of enhanced resource utilization. I can do a lot of things. I have no idea what business agility actually means. That said, uh, I'm going to talk about some strategic models uh, for cloud native businesses, um, some of which Adrian Cockcroft addressed yesterday in his opening keynote. Um, in terms of you know how Netflix is thinking about the cloud, and you know I would say that they're a great example of someone for whom it isn't just a cost reduction type of thing; it's really uh, a key enabler of their overall business model. Uh, Given that there are so many benefits, it means that economies of scale, uh, which I'm not even sure actually really exist when you delve into it, because there are various trade-offs there that I will uh, go into a little bit, but um, the point there is that um, economies of scale, therefore, are not the key to cloud benefits, uh, even if they did actually exist, because there are so many other benefits to the cloud that uh, cost optimization is uh, one small portion of that. Uh, I love the CapEx versus OpEx argument. Um, it's presented as if this is something really new with the cloud. Wow, we just solved it. And of course, it's been around for decades by means of the operating lease. And by the way, I doubt that it actually means anything because you can use another cloud service called uh, Bank Loans um, to get another resource called Money at a pay-per-use fee called an interest rate um, and, of course, translate OPEX to CAPEX and, and back. And in fact, what we're finding is that some of the leading users of cloud are actually doing things like taking pure nominal OPEX and capitalizing reserved instances um, because it's beneficial to them. And there's so many different um, characteristics here in terms of capital budgets, weighted average cost of capital, various tax incentives for investment, et cetera, that um, to me, this is like saying another unique benefit of the cloud is the ability to pay um, in you know, $10 bills rather than $20 bills. It's basically meaningless. Um, what the people with a little bit more sophistication uh, in this argument are really saying, which is a true benefit, is the ability to um, pay on a variable basis that is linked to the amount of use. And Shlomo covered that yesterday uh, a little bit in terms of kind of the dynamics of that market. I've also done a pretty in-depth analysis of the system dynamics of duopolies with one uh, pay-per-use provider and one uh, flat rate provider. And you can see some interesting effects, some of which are counterintuitive there. Rational decision makers uh, would select the lowest cost option if, in fact, there were any such thing as a rational decision maker. Unfortunately, there aren't any, at least on this planet. Um, we are all subject to a range of cognitive biases and bizarre heuristics based on bounded rationality. The entire field of behavioral economics and uh, several Nobel Prizes have been won for basically saying that uh, we are a bunch of lazy, hazy, crazy individuals. We're lazy in that we don't like to actually calculate optima. We just use heuristics to try and make decisions. Um, and we're hazy in that sense as well, that we don't get the exact solution. Um, and then finally, we're crazy, or as Dan Ariely perhaps more technically puts it, predictably irrational. Um, we make a lot of decisions that are not rational, but they're very repeatable, and they're repeatable not just among ourselves, but also among, um, you know, across individuals. Uh, if there are not compelling scale economies, the consolidation to a handful of providers argument uh, really fails to hold water. And in fact, I've done a little bit of analysis across other industries, and you actually find um, a high degree of, let's call it, bifurcation. So if you look at retail, yes, you have an increasing share that is dedicated to the top four, the top 10 providers, um, you know, regardless of the industry consolidation metric that you use, like an HHI index uh, versus a top 10. So yes, you have the Walmarts, the Targets, the Tescos of the world grabbing a little bit more share, but you also have a huge long tail that includes corner fruit stands and so forth. 
Um, given all that, the big switch argument, well, I'm going to um, completely demolish that in a few minutes, so why do it right now? Uh, the IT doesn't matter argument, I'll demolish a few minutes after that, so um, I'll skip directly to the reduced computing costs argument. Um, the reduced cost uh, leading to reduced spend is a really fantastic argument, and it's very obvious on the face of it, and it's too bad that it, it ignores a uh, primary insight of economics called price elasticity of demand. And the best way to look at um, this would be to take an analogy to the cellular telephony business. Uh, if you go back to 1980 when the Motorola Dynatac 3000X was first introduced, it cost $4,000. Um, the entire spend on mobility globally was exactly zero. Uh, in the space where the price for equivalent feature phone functionality dropped from $4,000 down to basically $10, rather than the spend on IT being a fraction of that zero, or sorry, the spend on mobility. Instead, the market has grown to well over a trillion dollars. Um, since IT is a general purpose technology, we would assume that it would be subject to those same price elasticity effects, and uh, that sort of is in line with the alleged paradox that Stanley Jevons came up with called uh, creatively enough, Jevons paradox, um, which basically was uh, very surprised that somehow cost reduction would lead to greater use um, and moreover greater total revenues. Um, <clears throat> I did a post in response to the uh, power pollution in the internet article from the New York Times. I won't cover the rebuttal here, but um, I think that data center electricity consumption being high and growing is absolutely fantastic because um, it's a little bit like saying, wow, the spend on you know, medicine is increasing. The question is not, what's the spend on medicine? The question is, what's the spend on medicine relative to how many lives are being saved? And similarly, if you look at IT, there's lots of substitution and optimization effects where spending uh, some money, let's say, on a video conference saves a metric ton of jet fuel per participant or spending a little bit of money on optimization calculations um, can result in enhanced consumer surplus or um, you know, optimized, let's say, uh, gas utilization for mobile fleets. Um, and security is an issue in the cloud. Uh, it's probably a bigger issue in the enterprise data center. Is security in the cloud perfect? Probably not. Can a very large provider um, afford to keep the world's leading experts in cybersecurity on staff and learn quickly and apply best practices better than uh, you know you or I can either at home or in our data center probably so um, I think cloud security um, is better in this and getting better in the same way that bank security uh, with their vaults and armed guards is probably slightly better than I have under the uh, mattress at home where I keep my money oops I shouldn't have said that now you know where all my money is so, I don't have any, I know. Is that the comment? I don't have any money or I don't have a mattress? I don't have money to buy a mattress someday. Uh, isn't the cloud a utility and thus a commodity? This is a popular argument and uh, the, the support for this argument starts with what I call the pizza problem. And the question is, when was the last time that you had a truly tasty pizza and you called over the server and said, excuse me, you know, I just want to say you know, thank you to your electric utility provider. Right? Of course, that's not who you thank. You thank the chef uh, or maybe the originator of the pizza recipe. Um, we'd call them a designer or developer. Um, and in fact, uh, you don't thank the hidden plumbing behind it. And the online equivalent of that is, wow, great pizza ordering website my compliments to the ISP or you know, the underlying you know, Google app engine or whatever that uh, actually provided that site. And so that argument was articulated uh, extremely well in an original article that Nick Carr wrote for the Harvard Business Review that was a little bit more emphatic than the follow-on book. And what he said was, um, IT doesn't matter. 
in case there was any question as to what his uh, conclusion was. And his argument, which actually makes a lot of sense if you read it the first time, is because IT has become ubiquitous, it's therefore a commodity, and things that are commodities are non-strategic, and therefore the correct management approach to that is to minimize spend, right? You know, you don't say, wow, you know, we just got a tax windfall, let's improve our paperclip ordering system, right? You don't do that. You apply it to strategic areas like marketing, customer relationships, things like that. And so the argument sort of makes sense. Um, and moreover, there's some interesting data from, uh, that McKinsey convolved with Gartner data to look at the correlation between IT spend and profitability. And there's a number of industry segments out there, but if we just get rid of that detail, basically it's a scatter plot. And the regression for that scatter plot, yeah, there's a slight slope there, but nothing to be so compelling that says that you know, uh, a direct investment in IT leads you to a uh, great investment or a great returns in terms of profitability. For me, this was a scary chart because it contradicted a lot of the things that I've been thinking in this arena that actually IT had some value. Then I realized actually it's not so scary because on an industry basis all this is saying is some industries are more profitable than others and that's based on the usual Porter Five Forces competitive strategy type of analysis around things like buyer power, supplier power, industry rivalry, threat of substitutes. And then there's sort of the IT intensity of the industry where, to put it bluntly, you would expect that Google probably spends a lot more thinking about IT in, in terms of their investments than, let's say, the fruit stand industry does um, or the um, what are those little things that are kind of rickshaws, you know, in a lot of cities where there's like the bicycle carts, right, bike, what are those, bike cabs? Pedicabs, thank you, uh, which are different than pedicures, I understand. So in any event, um, pedicabs, like that industry, you know, I guess is maybe ripe for some sort of digitalization and disruption, but they seem to be doing just fine kind of, you know, riding around their cabs and waiting at street corners. Um, so actually there isn't necessarily any correlation between the degree of digital usage versus the degree of profitability which is a function of those five forces. So in fact what we find is um, that there is some useful data but you have to differentiate further um, in terms of a variety of types of IT. First of all there are tactical systems and by that I'm thinking Things like paperclip ordering, expense reporting, um, room reservation systems. I just can't picture that um, someone, you know, there's a CEO on the cover of Fortune, and like the little sound bite over it is, you know, thank the Lord for our paperclip ordering system, right? You know, and then when you read the article, it's, you know, well, we were, you know, behind in the market, we were about to shutter our doors, but then we, fixed our you know, paperclip ordering, and now look where we are, market dominance. So yes, there's lots of systems like that. There's also core operational systems that do lots of useful things. But where I think it gets really interesting is at the level it is strategic um, and even, I would argue, existential. And um, I'm going to talk about this, this strategic level in more depth, but I want to just briefly explain existential. Some of you may remember Borders books. Um, some of you may still be ordering from Amazon.com. How is it that Borders is no longer around and Amazon.com is? I would suggest to you that Borders, for all its you know, strengths and or weaknesses, that its key failing was its ability to formulate an effective digital strategy in a time of transformation of not just the online you know, retail or retail industry, specifically books, but other industries as well. And so ultimately it becomes an existential question because without the skills and the insights and the execution capability for digital models, um, companies can literally go out of business as you know, Borders has proved, and I'll give you some more examples. Um, but I would argue that 
um, often IT can be strategic, and the only data point that I need to falsify the Nick Carr hypothesis that IT doesn't matter is this image right here. Does anyone know who this is and when? This is the Backrub project in 1993 or so in Sergey and Larry's dorm room. Um, since then, it's evolved somewhat. Instead of it just being a rack on Lego blocks in a dorm room, it's now Google Inc. with a $200 billion plus market cap, uh, you know, tens of billions in revenues and extremely high margins. Now, how did Google get from this picture to where they are now? Uh, what are the plausible factors that one might look at to say, you know, here's the case and let's go back and understand what the driving factors might be. You could say they had a global brand. Well, they do now, but they didn't at the time. They were just two kids with a dorm room project. Preferential access to capital? No. They managed to get some, but it's the same pool that anybody else had access to. Preferential access to resources, sort of a unique contract. The only people with the ability to index the web? Not at all. The web was an open resource that anybody can and would index. First mover advantage? No, uh, because they were the number 17 or so search provider. Um, the only thing that you can attribute their success to is IT, right? And it's not only better algorithms, but also the ability to execute those algorithms cost-effectively at scale. And by the way, they didn't even have a business model, right? They were against paid search originally, um, which they borrowed uh, the idea from goto.com. So their dominance uh, and their capabilities now, which by the way, um, are highly sustainable, not that great strategies always last forever, but their uh, share of the search market has basically remained at two-thirds regardless of all the other people jockeying for second, third, fourth, and fifth place. So I think that puts the nail in the coffin that IT doesn't matter. And of course, Google is not the only example. Lots of industries are undergoing what Mary Meeker calls reimagination. Um, reimagination is a code word for the complete and utter destruction of all we hold near and dear to our hearts and its replacement by scary new models that we can only imagine what the impact will be. Uh, the slide here shows basically the relative um, share, and by the way, this is a log scale of Encyclopedia Britannica. You can see where Encarta came in, and then you can see the exponential decline of the print edition of Encyclopedia Britannica and the exponential ascent of Wikipedia. Um, and it's not just uh, online versus print encyclopedias. Every industry is undergoing the same effect, uh, which is what Mark Andreessen uh, says simply as software is eating the world, right? Everything is becoming digitalized and informationalized, um, and therefore, if you don't have an effective strategy, you're literally at risk for being reimagined out of existence. There's also some hard quantitative data on the value of IT and uh, big data. So Eric Brynjolfsson at MIT um, did a great analysis basically showing a high correlation between data-driven decision-making and the um, ultimate key financial metrics that we all love, like return on equity and uh, operating margin and so forth. Um, a really cool analysis that I particularly love is from Sunil Mithas at the University of Maryland and his colleagues. And what he showed basically is after you adjust for lots of things, right, you know, you adjust for time lag intervals and you do all these statistical validity tests and everything else, it turns out that a dollar of IT returns two dollars. It's a double uh, your money um, not quite sure thing, right, because this is a average expected value of return, um, but across uh, lots of industries and companies that he studied, um, the average return was $1.90 on every dollar investment in IT. Now, there are a few interesting things about this. First of all, the investment, contrary to the belief that IT leads to cost savings, um, which it certainly can in some areas, um, virtually all of the benefit that he found was on the revenue side. The second thing is that 
investing a dollar in IT got you a bigger return than marketing slash advertising or than R&D. Um, so two important um, insights. So hopefully I've convinced you that IT, um, rather than just being something that should be cost reduced, the expletive deleted out of, um, and uh, something that is irrelevant for the C-level conversation, in fact, can be relevant, can generate uh, great returns, and can be um, either ex existential or even um, strategic. So that said, the next obvious question would be, OK, Joe, you've convinced me that IT may be useful. Um, now the question is, um, what about the cloud? How exactly would the cloud be strategic? Now, the way that you could answer this question, there are really two ways. One is you would say, what does the cloud do? And then you basically would make the claim, oh, the cloud does all these things, and they're really good and absolutely strategic. Um, that's a little bit of a wishful thinking. And so to be a little bit more rigorous in the argument, what I wanted to do was to work in reverse, which is to say, how would we know when something is strategic? And then let's work back and say, are there any things about the cloud that would kind of fit that model of strategy? Now, this is, a, I think, a good question. Um, I'd love to enlist all of you to kind of think through, how would you do this? Like, what is strategic? And I evaluated and kind of dug out, you know, back when I was young, which was centuries ago, um, a variety of different, you know, kinds of approaches, including Kepner Trigo and Michael Porter and some of the newer ones like Big Thing Strategy. And the one that I decided really uh, captured a lot of insight was one that originally I had sort of dismissed, which was the, uh, not this model, sorry, the Tracy and Wiersema model um, of value disciplines. Um, another model that I really like is this experience economy model. And the experience economy model says that um, as industries evolve, um, you can get higher and higher margin um, as you move from commodities that are dug out of the ground to products that are then made from those commodities to services that then put a service wrapper around that to experiences um, including a special type of experience, which is the individual transformation. Now, to give you a sense of what that means, I can you know, basically grow coffee beans, which are a few cents a pound. Uh, I can then roast them and package them and sell them at retail for what might be you know, $10 a pound. I can offer them via a coffee shop um, like Dunkin' Donuts, in which case, I can get you know, maybe $20 or $30 a pound, as it were, for those beans um, by selling cups of coffee at $1.50 or so. I can deliver experiences. Here's where I'm starting to transform into you know, maybe a Starbucks or even at a higher extreme, a high-end French restaurant where you're paying you know, $10 uh, for you know, a cup of coffee that actually has about a penny worth of coffee in it. So you're doing all that. And then individual transformations are things like, you know, medical procedures or university education where you're actually transforming the individual. And I added to their model this notion of societal transformations because if you look, for example, at the key role of Twitter and Facebook um, in things like the Arab Spring or uh, the use of Ushahidi uh, for crowdsourcing data um, that's geolocated to help solve with like crime and election results in Kenya, you end up with things well above the individual. But I'm not going to focus on that because I want to focus just on business benefits. And there, this model that I alluded to is the value disciplines model from Michael Tracy and Fred Wiersema. And what they say basically is that companies can achieve um, three major sorts of strategic competitive differentiation in an industry. One is through operational excellence, in other words, better processes. Another is through product leadership, better products and services. And a third is through customer intimacy, in other words, better and deeper customer relationships. Um, I love their model. Uh, I added to that another one, which is sort of a meta-discipline, which is accelerated innovation. Because I think that if you can increase the pace of innovation, you know, 
always getting to the next level of operational excellence. For example, Walmart um, was shown to um, achieve its results partly through obviously being the lowest cost provider, but the way that they became the low cost provider was through things like excellence in cross-docking logistics and supplier management. Uh, product leadership is pretty key. Some of you probably have, you know, remember the iPhone when it came out, the iPad when it came out. It's anyone's guess what would be the product leader in that category now, but nevertheless, that can be an effective strategy as well. Uh, customer intimacy basically says even if your processes are not that good and your products are not that good, if you can have really deep customer relationships and help um, provide solutions to their problems and needs better than anyone else, than anyone else you can um, have an effective business strategy. Um, so what does that mean in a cloud, big data, mobile, social, global, geo-located, context-sensitive, personalized, let's throw as many buzzwords into this sentence as I can, um, sense. So operational excellence, what comes to mind is the use of things like real-time data, mobility, um, to get traffic data, feed it up into the cloud, whether it's private or public, um, take things like um, positions of all of your delivery trucks, field support trucks, you know, um, cross-country um, semi-tractor trailers, um, and basically optimize everything associated with those operations by convolving all that data together and doing everything from three-dimensional bin packing for packing the trucks to optimal route selection, including traffic congestion avoidance. So this is a case where um, you can, I believe, as a provider in this industry, um, basically have a high degree of operational excellence, more packages delivered within the interval, therefore lower SLA payouts, you know, um, reduced number of dissatisfied customers, um, therefore better word of mouth, therefore reduced customer churn, therefore improved total customer lifetime value, and all of those typical business metrics by leveraging the cloud strategically. Another good example is product leadership. I mentioned the iPad. Um, of course, a tablet is not much more than a great hot plate without all of the things behind it. And what makes any one of these endpoint devices strong is not so much the endpoint as much as the fact that it's part of a total product service system that includes both the endpoint and the cloud services, whether it's iTunes, the App Store, Google Play, what have you. Also, the notion that it's a platform for innovation to help expand that ecosystem to therefore create a stronger, better um, product service system and therefore lead to leadership in this category, which in turn, of course, provides the opportunity to um, charge more and uh, uh, acquire higher margins as a result. But it's not just high-tech devices, or at least high-tech electronic devices. Things like GM OnStar is a great example of an endpoint called a car that's tied to a cloud. As I like to think of it, these days cars are uh, particularly exceptional Bluetooth accessories. Um, but beyond that, of course, they're being tied to the cloud, which doesn't necessarily need to mean AWS. It can also mean you know, concierge services and plain old telephony, or at least cellular telephony, to link that endpoint to services delivered on a location-independent basis. Um, but it isn't just even manufactured high technology devices. We can think about something as mundane as a clothing brand, or at least a clothing and footwear brand, like Nike that has managed to differentiate itself leveraging the cloud. And I don't just mean the ability to, let's say, order and configure clothing online and you know, whatever um, size you want. There's some clothing companies that are doing really interesting things there with kind of 3D modeling. Um, and then sort of exact sizing. But I'm thinking here of Nike Plus where I have the ability for Nike Plus to track the routes that I run and then um, upload that into the cloud, use gamification and social networking to be able to help increase the bond between a particular brand and this particular set of capabilities that is delivered through the cloud and mobility. Customer intimacy is another great example, and here I'm thinking about what a Netflix.com does or a Pandora or an Amazon.com that basically says, you know, movies we would recommend or 
other customers you know, bought this, and we think you would like this. And so that is not just so much that they developed a better algorithm that says, let's take the title of the book and try and do some matching. This is based on taking millions of data points, feeding it up into their information processing capability, and then in turn returning to each customer as an individual a sense of what they are likely to enjoy and therefore, again, increase stickiness um, as well as um, provide upsell capabilities depending on the exact implementation. Um, and moreover, it's what I call frictionless intimacy. In other words, a lot of this can be done without any additional effort. The, you know, yes, you can do things like rate movies with multiple stars, but guess what? Now in the streaming era, Netflix doesn't need to have you rate things with multiple stars because they know that you watched 10 minutes of it and then never went back versus that you restream that movie 20 times like I have with, let's say, Man on Fire and The Matrix. Um, so the ability to have deeper bonds, and this is true customer intimacy, not in the 90 cents of on-site dedicated account teams that are embedded with the customer, but in the modern sense, which is cloud-mediated um, and really intimate in the sense that it isn't just up to the account director to say, I think the customer would benefit from this based on their strategic initiatives. It's um, true intimacy based on sophisticated algorithms. Lastly, in terms of accelerated innovation, um, I think that there's lots of ways in which the cloud, whether it's a private cloud with internal collaboration and knowledge management tools, can accomplish things. But also um, of particular interest is things like um, the Netflix Cloud Prize, um, and more recently the Net, or sorry, the original Netflix Prize, more recently the Netflix Cloud Prize. Um, Adrian mentioned yesterday morning I'm one of the Netflix Cloud Prize judges, and um, I love what they are doing for a variety of reasons. First of all, they're paying to incent the open source movement. Secondly, they're helping raise the bar for common tools that in this case are not particularly strategic, um, but they are of operational importance. Um, and moreover, they're doing it via this uh, open contest. I did a post for Information Week a few weeks ago that kind of lays out a lot of the interesting economics around that, which I won't cover here, but briefly, um, one of the interesting things about a contest is it's fixed fee, right? And you don't have to all of a sudden try and hire the world experts in that field. What you can do is for a fixed fee, whether it's 100000 or a million dollars, hire the best researchers in the world and you only have to pay the best one of them. So costs are flat even though the number of participants can scale up to $7 billion. Um, another interesting use of the cloud is in organizational um, uh, support for sort of today's more modern organization. And briefly, what I'll mention there is there's a cool model from David Nadler, if you remember him, that basically um, says that you can look at a few things, one of which is the environmental complexity that a firm faces. And if environmental complexity is small, and by the way, the pace of change is small, a simple model will work, right? The fruit stand model. Um, if environmental complexity is high, but the pace of change is slow, then the traditional bureaucracy can be very effective, right? And that's how you kind of develop standard processes to deal with complexity, have functional specialization that makes sense. If the pace of change is high, then you want to move to an entrepreneurial model. That's kind of more the startup, you know, everybody knows each other, tightly coupled model. But then when you get to sort of larger enterprises that have to deal with a high pace of change, you end up with the network organization model, things like case teams, you know, overlay organizational um, structures and things like that. Now, this was a great model that described some things that were going on, but today what we found is the notion of sort of a fixed boundary organization is giving way to something that is more of the networked enterprise. Uh, and here, just think about Apple, where maybe they outsource some of their design to an Adeo or Frog Design. Their manufacturing is Foxconn. Their distribution might be partly through Best Buy. But uh, this is a really interesting model. Right now, I bet many of you are wearing Lee and Fung clothing, whether you realize it or not. They white label to a lot of the major brands. 
And their model is very interesting. They have a global network of suppliers that includes you know, companies across Asia. And this week, maybe they'll have their thread come from South Korea. They'll have their fabric come from China. They'll have their buttons come from Thailand and do their sewing in Singapore. But next week, they may completely change that around and get fabric from Singapore, and you get the idea, right? So this is not only a networked virtual enterprise because they own no manufacturing capability themselves, even though they're a multi-billion dollar enterprise. Their whole business model is around identifying suppliers and dynamically allocating them based on real-time response to changing designs as well as um, supplier selection. So in this kind of world, which some people call the Hollywood organization model, where you pick a director, pick some actors, pick a screenwriter, change screenwriters, and then end up with a one-time product, um, I think is becoming more and more typical as competition accelerates in our world. So the net result is that to support that model requires um, not only the cloud, but the intercloud and um, capabilities at the SaaS layer for a loosely coupled interconnection. Um, and actually, um, I was talking with someone from Liquid Planner uh, yesterday that said, oh yeah, they have some capabilities to do exactly that. And so that's sort of an interesting model of how, um, whether it's a uh, single SaaS product or emerging intercloud capabilities, um, which I'm involved in with the IEEE, and they're making a lot of progress there, um, the kind of progress that uh, one would expect. I've covered just the tip of the iceberg because I laid out um, when to use the cloud and also when not to use the cloud. So there's um, you know, lots of different use cases. Briefly, things like communications is a great cloud use case. Social networking, obviously, it's hard to picture. Oh, yes, we have our, my, I have my own behind the firewall social network that is untethered and sitting in my basement. Right? That just doesn't work. It's inherently cloud-centric the same way that um, having conferences like this are inherently cloud-centric. We probably couldn't do this, you know, hey, why don't you guys all come over to my house and we'll climb into the basement, we'll grab some chairs and have this type of event, right? It made sense for us to meet at a central location. A couple of last thoughts are on uh, sort of the business agility aspect. If you think about product life cycle, any industry starts at zero, grows, peaks, and then is either um, you know, plateaus or declines or maybe can be um, re, um, regrown through some sort of, sort of rejuvenation. Um, if you look at the number of industry rivals, of course, there's a first entrant and then those rapidly grow until profitability drops out and then people exit strategically or there's consolidation. And so what this inevitably leads to is a profit curve that looks like this where in the area up front where you're investing in products and services, you have negative profitability, and then the um, early entrants have higher profitability till the products or services commoditize and profitability drops off to below the long-term average. Um, this is an interesting curve, but it um, belies uh, something that's even more interesting, which is that, of course, not all the entrants are alike. Instead the first mover has some critical advantage um, because by moving quickly in the development phase, they reduce their cost to bring something to market. And then by being the first entrant, they can capture the high margins from the uh, innovators and early adopters and the early majority um, before the other entrants have entered and start to um, engage in price competition. Um, so what does that mean? What it means is that you end up with things like these assorted financial benefits throughout the curve, ultimately leading to uh, much higher net present value based on profitability generated in those phases. Now what this means in terms of the cloud is that if I can use platform as a service capabilities and do early testing and do experimentation via the cloud, then I can end up with accelerated and compressed time to market. Um, and of course, if I can leverage the public cloud's elasticity, um, I can end up with um, uh, a lot of benefits in terms of time to volume. And uh, not shown here, but I explore it in some depth, is also that obviously there's dramatic risk, re risk reduction as I reduce provisioning intervals 
um, and that risk reduction includes loss of revenue due to unserved or underserved customers, as well as um, the excess costs associated with underutilized resources and either the CapEx or the OpEx associated with those um, excess resources. So uh, all that means that the cloud has lots of benefits. Hopefully I've convinced you that rather than this simply being a cost play, although there are lots of cost benefits and I quantify them excruciatingly, I, I mean interestingly, um, at length, and um, they're certainly valid, but I think it's equally important to view the strategic benefit that the cloud and all, all its beauty and wonder, whether it's infrastructure, platform, or software as a service, can derive in terms of helping companies achieve strategic competitive advantage in their industries. So I'm not quite sure what the time thing says. I think I have 4,500 minutes left, um, but um, perhaps that's wrong. So am I out of time or should I take a question? No. no time for questions. Okay, well that answers my question. So I guess we did get a question. Thank you very much.